Okay, everybody ready? All right. Last time, we didn't have a whole lot of time after the quiz and homework and everything else we talked about, but we did get through uh, talking about some acidity of alcohols. And this is going to be very important, hopefully, if we get there today, uh, with some of the alcohol reactions, because the acidity of alcohols often, and also the basicity of alcohols, often helps explain what the reactions are going to be. So don't forget this stuff. It wasn't just like, here's the beginning stuff, and now we're doing other stuff. It's, it's all going to be related. Um, to move on, though, let's start talking about some reactions. Now, first, we're going to go through some reactions that you have already talked about last semester um, that apply to alcohols. And, and generally, the way these chapters are set up is we talk about the preparation of the functional group, and then we talk about some of the reactions of the functional group. So uh, for most of this chapter, well, for the most of the first part of this chapter, we're looking to look at preparations of alcohols, and then we'll talk about what they actually do. All right, first way to prepare substitutions is actually not a great way, but we should list it because you've certainly seen it before, and that's by substitution. Okay. And these are reactions like, that you've probably seen before, where you form an alcohol um, from an alkyl halide through substitution with sodium hydroxide. Um, what type of a reaction would this be? SN2, right? This would be SN2. What does that mean supposed to be? Sorry, that's CL. I should note that, actually. This, this always comes up. I connect my CL um, mostly so because sometimes, not usually in a class this advanced, but in more beginning classes, people will mistake it for CI if I just write this, so I connect them. Same thing with aluminum AL, but um, anyway, if you see that, that's what that is. It's CL connected, okay. You can also substitute, um, of course, SN1 with a weaker nucleophile like water. All right, why is that a bad idea? What is wrong with these syntheses? I, uh, I won't say wrong because they're reactions. They do happen. Why are they not effective from a synthetic standpoint? If you want to make an alcohol in the lab, why is this not the first place you turn? Um, well, in that case, we're, we're producing the OH, so actually you want it to not be a good leaving group. Um, well, not other, not other positions for substitution because that's definitely the most stable. Um, but, oh, I, yeah. Is it because uh, it could go forth with elimination? Right. There, in all these cases, there are other competing reactions. And remember, there was a big chunk of time spent on that last semester about whether something's going to be SN1 or favor SN2 or E1 or E2, and those things were always kind of in competition, and sometimes you get more of one than another. That's the main problem, is you'll usually get some trouble with competing reactions, whether it's the SN1, SN2, E1, or E2. Um, it's, I mean, yeah, in certain situations, this might work. Uh, it might be the easiest thing to do. But as sort of a general way to always reliably make these things, it's, it's really not the best because there are going to be all these other competing mechanisms around. So let's, let's kind of leave this, let's put a little star here and just say this is usually not the best choice.
and let's move on to addition. Now these reactions you already know. Um, what, how do you make alcohols through addition? Three different ones. Yeah, they're, they're in all cases. This is what we're talking about is hydration. Of alkenes. Okay. And there's three ways to do that. So let's kind of make a let's make ourselves a little diagram. Help review some of these reactions anyway. Okay, somebody give me one uh, set of conditions for hydration of alkenes. Okay, so oxymercuration would be one, right? So let's draw the product from that. Okay. What's another set of conditions? Hydroboration. Hydroboration, sure. I'm going to draw it with just boring, but of course you know those are there are various boring's that can be used here. Well, stuff with boron, you can think of. And that gives us the anti-Markovnikov product. And then what else? What's the last one? Yeah, this is uh, acid catalyzed. So dilute sulfuric acid or water and acid, however that's expressed, will get us this. And that's usually the easiest way to go, but we have to watch for the possibility of carbocation rearrangements. No, just for this one. Rearrangements. And as a review, uh, we're not going to go through it now, but maybe make a note to yourself. Make sure that you know the mechanisms for the, these. Make sure you know the stereoselectivity or stereospecificity of these as well. All right. So now we're going to look at some new ways which we actually did in lab, but a new way that you can do it is reduction of carbonyls. And this is, if you remember, a carbonyl is something like this. We can add hydrogen to it to do something like that. That's kind of the general reaction. Uh, we're going to talk about this. We're also going to talk about adding other things, things other than hydrogen to it, uh, R groups, through something called Grignard uh, reagents. Before we do that, Let's talk about what this reduction means. Um, did you talk about reduction last semester? And the difference between reduction from organic standpoint and reduction from an inorganic standpoint? Sort of. OK, let's review it quickly. From a traditional chemical standpoint, what does oxidation mean? Electrons. Losing electrons, right. Reduction is gaining electrons. And that's true from an organic standpoint as well. Uh, however, organic molecules, it's not always convenient to actually find like absolute oxidation states. I mean, not that it's a real thing anyway. It's a way of electron accounting, deciding where you want to put your electrons. The book does a pretty nice job of um, talking about what this means. So I, I kind of like this. I'm going to go through it, but then I'm also going to add and talk about it from a um, more practical standpoint. 
So let's take methanol. Here's methanol, and we want to find the oxidation state on that carbon. All right. Um, now, another way that we account for electrons is formal charge. And when we do formal charge, we say carbon has four valence electrons, uh, minus four bonds, and no lone pairs, so it's a zero formal charge. Oxidation state is another way of accounting for electrons. But in that case, what you do is you put all of the electrons on the more electronegative atom. So you assume that the bonds are totally ionic, which is not actually true, but remember, it's accounting. So you, you do it like this. Let's go back to the old-fashioned Lewis dot structure. OK. Now between the oxygen and the carbon, which one's more electronegative? Oxygen. So we put those two electrons with the oxygen. And then between carbon and hydrogen, which one is? They're about the same, but, it's tech, but for this t purposes of this accounting, um, it's carbon. But not, they're not different enough to produce much of a dipole, but for accounting purposes, they are. So we put these electrons with the carbon. All right? And then we use the valence electrons and do the same kind of calculation uh, as with formal charge. So we say that carbon has four valence electrons minus six around it right now. So the oxidation state on carbon is minus two. I think that's right, right? OK. So what does that mean? I mean, practically, we don't care. Uh, it doesn't matter that this carbon is an oxidation state of minus 2. It doesn't really have any effect to its reactivity. The thing we care most about is when a reaction happens, is carbon being oxidized or being reduced? And one way to find that is by doing a calculation like this. But another way is just sort of looking at it. Um, for instance, let's take methanol, and let's say that we take methanol and make it into formaldehyde. Would you consider that an oxidation process or a reduction process? For the oxygen or for the For the carbon. For the, for the carbon. oxidation. So it's, like it's an oxidation. Yeah, so we can use the same we can use the same accounting and say that the carbon is minus two here. What would be the oxidation state on this carbon then? Zero, right? All of these electrons from the double bond would go with the oxygen, and then these four would stay with the carbon. So carbon has four valence electrons, minus four from those bonds is zero. So it's minus two here and zero here. That's oxidation. But think about what actually what happened here from a graphical standpoint. You got you lost some hydrogen, right? and carbon makes more bonds to oxygen. So a shorthand here is to say that in an oxidation process, the carbon will have, um, well, let's not say fewer. Let's say um, in oxidation, you decrease bonds to hydrogen. And in reduction is the opposite. You increase bonds to hydrogen, as opposed to other electronegative elements. Okay. That's a good general accounting way. Now, of course, there are um, some specifics that will change these things a little bit. But you know, if you're looking specifically at, let's say, a bromine or a chlorine or whatever. But these are generally true, and these rules will generally work. Yeah. It doesn't really make sense to me because there's still four bonds. There's a double bond. Bonds to hydrogen. Oh, bonds to hydrogen. Yeah, decreased bonds. And we're talking just about a particular atom. So the oxidation of that carbon atom means it has fewer bonds to hydrogen. If we go back up then, you can see how this reduction that we're going to discuss momentarily is indeed a reduction. 
because you've added you've added hydrogen. You can also think of it the opposite way that it's an increase of bonds to oxygen or other electronegative elements. Um, that's not always right, but it usually is. This is how I would think of it from a problem solving standpoint. Generally, you can do it quickly by thinking of this rule as about bonds to hydrogen. If it's not clear or if it seems tricky, just go back and do the, the electron way. Okay. All right, so let's look at some of these reactions. Or actually, hold on. One more thing, because it's, it's, it's more obvious when it's something like oxygen. But let's talk about... like an alkene. We know this reaction from last semester. Is that a reduction or an oxidation? Does it still fit with those rules? Sure. We're adding hydrogen. It's a reduction. All right. Let's talk about reducing. We'll go back to that number three way to produce alcohols, reduction of carbonyls. Uh, one you already know. which is that reduction that we just discussed, where you can use hydrogen with some kind of metal catalyst, usually platinum, palladium, or nickel. And that works reasonably well for ketones and aldehydes. Um, Although the conditions are a little bit uh, difficult, you need a special hydrogen reactor that is a high pressure chamber that you can put hydrogen in. They sometimes need high temperature because these are not as uh, reactive. They have higher activation energies than the alkenes or alkynes. So when you go through the literature and you look at these, they're usually done in labs that already have the thing set up, so it's easier for them. Um, if you don't have a hydrogen reactor or you know, you don't want, or it's in the shelf and you don't want to get it set up, generally you don't do this method, you go with a different method. Um, kind of like what we did in lab on Monday, we didn't have a hydrogen reactor ready, so we use a different method. Oh, the other thing to keep, to watch out for with these is that it's not selective to carbonyls. There are some catalysts you can get that will do that, but generally, these types of general things will also reduce alkenes and alkynes, which means that if you have uh, a bunch of alkenes and alkynes in your molecule, this is not a good step because you're going to reduce everything. You're going to want some conditions that are more suited to uh, more suited to carbonyls. All right, so that's the first one. Call that one. And here's the second one. This one's new, and this is what we did Monday. And this is the sodium borohydride reduction. Which you know from lab is an ABH4. Now, usually we get to this before we do that lab, so that's why it might not have made a whole lot of sense yesterday when you were trying to put those reactions together, or a couple days ago. And in this reaction, again, you take a ketone or an aldehyde, and you usually do it 
in the presence of an alcohol. So ethanol, methanol, or in some cases water. And, and then as you know from lab, there's also a separate workup step where you have to add acid to make sure everything gets protonated. Um, now that kind of differs from book to book how they actually uh, express that. If you do it this way, the solvent can act as a source of a proton and can protonate it. Um, depending on your reaction conditions, you may also need a separate step. So if you see some books that say step one NaBH4, step two H3O plus, like acid and water, it's the same thing. They're just not specifying that here. Um, that's another reason why the lab is nice because you actually get some experience um, of what the experimental conditions actually have to be to do this. Okay, let's talk about this then mechanistically. Sodium borohydride is a, well, borohydride is a tetrahedral ion. And it has a negative formal charge on boron, but boron is, has extremely low electronegativity. So the, the dipoles on borohydride actually go toward the hydrogen. And the hydrogen is sort of like H minus. That's why it's called borohydride. Um, you can't actually do these reactions with just hydride, like sodium hydride, because sodium hydride is too basic. And it will actually deprotonate one of the hydrogens uh, next to the carbonyl. We'll talk about those reactions in a couple chapters. So you use this thing, uh, borohydride, which is a source of H minus, but it's not as basic as just pure H minus. Um, so what we, how we usually draw this is one of the BH bonds, those electrons, form a bond with the carbonyl, and the electrons move up to the oxygen. leaving this kind of intermediate. Yeah, the electrons, because the electrons are more on the hydrogen. So it's those electrons that are forming that bond. And then whatever your solvent or water or acid protonates the alcohols. Uh, as you're doing your review, um, you know, up to the first exam, make sure you focus on drawing proper mechanisms. Remember, arrows need to come from electrons and go to usually atoms or sometimes bonds, but they always come from the electrons. They're showing the electrons moving somewhere, not the atom moving somewhere. Um, and then make sure that you're drawing both arrows that are necessary so that carbons don't end up with five bonds. If that's something you're a little bit rusty on, make sure you go back to those early chapters where they talk about how to draw proper arrows um, and, and review that a little bit. So that's the sodium borohydride reduction. And this works nicely for ketones and aldehydes. I'm not going through it too much right now, but ketones and aldehydes, the reactivity, the reaction is going to be a big part of this semester in a couple chapters. So uh, we'll detail it then. One note you might want to just keep in mind, aldehydes are more reactive. So if you want to reduce, um, if you have a ketone and an aldehyde in the same molecule, the aldehyde will get preferentially reduced over the ketone, um, unless you use, but you can use multiple equivalents to reduce everything. When we get to that chapter, we'll talk about how to actually protect the uh, aldehyde and only deal with the ketone, but we'll get there when we get there. All right, questions about that? Okay. Do yeah, okay. Next one then, that's three.
lithium, aluminum, hydride. Sometimes just abbreviated LAH. If you notice, lithium is just above sodium, aluminum is just below boron. So aluminum hydride has similar, uh, some similar properties to borohydride, where you've got a, an aluminum in the center, a tetrahedral aluminum that has four hydrogens. The dipole is going toward the hydrogens. The difference here is that this is a much stronger. Reductant. This is much more reactive than lithium borohydride or than sodium borohydride. Uh, we, you saw sodium borohydride. You know, you opened it up, you measured it out. Nothing bad really happened. Um, the same thing could be said for lithium aluminum hydride. But if lithium aluminum hydride touches water, like if you drip water on it, it'll just burst into flames um, because it's that reactive. That actually happened here. I guess two years ago. It wasn't like a bad, terrible fire, but just in the hood. Somebody had washed glassware and was moving the glassware over the way boat full of lithium aluminum hydride, and it just dripped and burst into flames. So. All of it? Hmm? All of it? Yeah, it's kind of a chain reaction. It takes off pretty quick once it builds up the heat. Yeah. Um, not like a whole jar for it was sure. full. It was like a little way boat full, but yeah, there was some fire. And yeah, and then he was he was a research student, and then he was actually in this class. And I just made fun of him for it constantly, so I think he felt bad. But, oh well. Um, anyway, so we don't use that in this lab or, or in this particular class. The reason you might want a stronger reductant is because you can reduce more things with it. Um, Let's start with just kind of the same stuff. It can do the same thing as sodium borohydride. And in fact, in many cases, you don't need any acid to work it up with because it's so reactive. You can work it right up with water. And it basically does the same thing that we just talked about. It also has, we're going to say in quotes, the same mechanism as above. That's not entirely true. Uh, the lithium actually is involved in this reaction because lithium combines strongly with oxygen. And uh, the lithium and the aluminum actually deal with this oxygen as well. So it's a much more complex uh, mechanism involving the metals as well as the hydride. But for the purposes of this class and of second semester organic chemistry classes around the world, we usually treat this as the same mechanism as the borohydride reduction. So you can, you can draw it the same way. So let's talk about why it's important that this is a stronger reductant then. Um, if the mechanism is basically the same and the reaction is you know, looking pretty much the same. Here's why. Let's say you have a carboxylic acid. And you react that with sodium borohydride. What will happen here is you'll simply deprotonate the acid. make hydrogen gas and boring. Not a very productive reaction in most cases. That's a not a not a great base. It's it's just not a uh, not a good way to go. That's not usually a useful reaction that you want to do. What if instead we use lithium aluminum hydride we can do the reduction. Okay. And that's the same thing 
with esters. So a methyl ester can be reduced with lithium aluminum hydride, but not with uh, sodium borohydride. Where's that other yoga? We're going to talk about that. We'll go through this mechanism. So the key, to you, key for lithium aluminum hydride is that it can reduce acids and esters, and borohydride can't. Not a strong enough reductant. So let's talk about this mechanism because it's a little bit weird. Why wouldn't you make the dye alcohol or something? Um, or why does this other substituent disappear? Actually, we should make one note here. It's actually not stoichiometric because you do, depro you do still deprotonate the acid, so you need an excess of lithium aluminum hydride uh, to do this. Um, let's look at the ester. First step looks mostly the same. You have your aluminum hydride. that reacts with the carbonyl. Okay. And now generally, in, or in the reduction of aldehydes and ketones, the next step would be the protonation of the oxygen, and that's where it would stop. Right? That's what we did before. So here's how it changes now. Something happens actually faster than that. In basic solution, the methoxide over on the right uh, can actually be an okay leaving group if you're in a strongly basic solution. So what happens is the electrons come down here and reform a carbonyl, kicking off the methoxide as a leaving group. And you're left with, in this case, an aldehyde. OK. So now, why don't you think we stop there? Uh, not quite. But remember, we have an excess in there. Yeah, it'll attack it again. Why? What if we didn't use an excess? Would it not attack it again? It may or may not. It will. It will, actually. Um, the reason for that is that aldehydes are more reactive than esters, um, also acids. So if you had only one equivalent, it would actually preferentially attack this and leave you a bunch of unreacted starting material. So there's sort of no way to stop this if there's still any aluminum hydride around, because this is now the most reactive thing that's, that's in the solution. Okay. So the same thing will happen again. And now this reaction looks just like what we, what we did before. We can protonate it. And make the alcohol. So the aldehyde. 
is more reactive. That'll preferentially react, and that's why we use an excess. Okay. Questions about that? Okay. Now, thinking about this mechanism, because this is something a little bit different than what you would have done last semester, let's try this out and test ourselves a little bit. I'm going to ask you to draw the product and the mechanism. Now, I would do those in the reverse order. Draw the mechanism, it'll lead you to the product if you do it right. and try that one out. Okay, again, it's useful to think about this mechanistically so that you can make sure to get the right thing. So let's just go through this by drawing the mechanism and let me know if you have questions or if your mechanism looks a little bit different. I'm just going to draw one of the hydrogen bonds because that's all we care about right now. And I'm going to show it attacking the carbonyl. <coughs> Okay. What's my next step then? The oxygen is going to come back down and the sigma bond is going to uh, transfer its electrons to the oxygen. Right. So I'm going to do that kind of a process. Now, it looks a little weird here because we're in this ring, but the mechanism notice doesn't change. It's the exact same as what we did above. We simply broke that CO bond. The only difference is that that oxygen is still tethered to the other side of the, uh, of the chain. Now whenever I do these chain opening reactions, what I usually do is try to keep it in roughly the same shape so I don't lose carbons or get screwed up. And then at the end, we can stretch everything out and make it look pretty. So now we have something like that. Now, whether you want to protonate this now or later uh, from a mechanism standpoint doesn't really matter. It kind of depends on the solvent, if there's anything around that can protonate it. The important part is to continue to reduce the aldehyde. And then we'll do two successive protonations. I'm not going to draw those here. And if it's obvious that we're protonating or deprotonating something, um, you don't have to necessarily draw every little arrow. At this point, we can assume that. And I am going to stretch this thing out a little bit. So we've got one, two, three, four, five carbons. One, two, three, four, five carbons with an OH on the fourth carbon and an OH on the first carbon. So that's what my final product should look like. Is it required to first stretch out? Do we um, technically could we leave it in like that similar shape? Right? I guess technically you could, but you should stretch it out. I mean I, guess, I can't really mark you wrong if the stuff's connected right, but yeah. if you were to like publish a mechanism on something in a paper, they would just think that you were an idiot if you left it in the right the, like weird way. So try to be professional about it. If it's a really tricky one and you can't get it, then I guess that's okay. 
if you leave it this way and then you also stretch it out, but you stretch it out wrong, I won't take off much. You know, maybe a point or something. Uh, here? The, the key thing to look for with that is the existence of something that can leave. And this is always a little bit tough to talk about here because of the, uh, because we really get into this later when we talk about the chemistry of esters. But whenever there's something connected here to this carbon that can leave, that can act as a leaving group, then it, it generally will be faster for this to reform and, and that break off. Now the other part of that answer is that these steps are in equilibrium. So it is actually kind of going back and forth. But the reduction is not really in equilibrium. So this is going back and forth, but once this reacts with this again, it can't go backwards anymore, so it pushes it in this direction. All right, so that's, uh, that's reductions. Any questions about that, about those? All right, the final reduction we're going to talk about of uh, preparing, um, preparing alcohols is Grignard reagents. Um, actually, I'm going to put a little note here. There's a little section in your book about how to prepare diols. It's nothing fancy. It's nothing new. So I'm not going to spend time on it. But as you're, going, as you're flipping through, just take a quick look at it. Let's go to 3, which is, wait, no, that was 3, 4. Yeah, it's right in between these two things. It's like 13.5. It's just a couple paragraphs. Um, that I'm, th again, it's basically saying, well, if you have two ketones, you can reduce both of them and make a diol. Okay. That's pretty much it. Um, and then, yeah, let's talk about Grignard reductions. Has anybody ever heard of Grignard rea re reagents before? Okay. Some classes do it in the first semester. Some people may have just heard of it. Um, we're going to talk about it now. So let's, let's do it officially. It's an old, old type of chemistry where a halide is reacted with magnesium metal in the presence of some kind of ether and that ether can be whatever so anyway, there's a lot of stuff there to form This sort of um, metal thing called a Grignard reagent. So the metal inserts between the R and the X bond. Now, that's not really the case either. Um, much work has been done on this, and it's still not particularly well known what a Grignard reagent actually looks like in solution. It's quite a large complex of multiple R's, multiple magnesiums, and multiple X's kind of all interacting in various ways. Uh, the solvent also plays a part here. There are solvent molecules that stabilize the magnesium, which is why you do it in the presence of ethers. So very complex things going on. But this is how they're usually written. And uh, they're usually thought of as a source of negatively charged carbon, sort of like a nucleophilic or basic carbon ion. The actual reaction of, is much more complicated than that. The, the mechanism of how these things react is still, after all these years, uh, not really known completely. Um, but we know that it does work, and it has worked for a long time, so it's, it's a really useful reaction. In a more real example, you can take something like bromobenzene, and react it with magnesium in the presence of diethyl ether.
and make what this the way you would name this is phenyl magnesium bromide and that's a green energy agent that's relatively stable we're actually going to do this later in the semester we're going to make this we're going to make phenyl magnesium bromide and react it with some stuff um, and it's, uh, it's, it's relatively, you, you can work with it. It's reactive with water, it's reactive with air, but not to the point where it's just going to like explode. Uh, you can actually buy a solution of phenyl magnesium bromide pre-made, although it's easy enough, most people just make it themselves. You can also do this with uh, chlorides or chlorines or iodides. They all, make, they all have slightly different properties. We're not going to get into the intricacies of that. But the point is that a phenyl magnesium bromide is sort of like having a phenyl, a negatively charged phenyl group like this. Okay. Um, we're we're going to get it, talk about the warnings a little bit in a minute before I actually show you what they do. But don't get too excited about this. Everybody gets too excited about green neutral reagents, and it's great. They do a lot of good stuff, but you see negatively charged carbon, and people think, oh, great. Well, that's a, I can just add carbon to anything now. Uh, I don't have to use those stupid uh, alkynes anymore. I can just use these and put on whatever I want. That's not really the case. Um, green neutral reagents of this type are not suited to nucleophilic substitution. You can't use them for nucleophilic substitution. Uh, they're also very basic, so you can't use them in the presence of alcohols or other or amines or other things, other sources of acidic hydrogen. Um, but what they do, they do well. Let's talk about how those how Grignard reagents can work in the preparation of alcohols. We use them, whoops, much like the hydride reductions we just saw. In fact. For our purposes, the mechanisms are the same. So you might take a methyl magnesium bromide followed by water. and make something like this. Okay. Now you've actually accomplished two things. You've reduced the carbonyl to the alcohol, just like with the hydride reduction, but you've also made a carbon-carbon bond um, by adding the, the, the methyl group. So let's look at the mechanism. When we draw Grignard mechanisms, yes, they're quite complicated, but we're going to assume that they're not. And we're going to draw the mechanisms the same way that we drew them for the hydride. So we're going to pretend that the Grignard is like a negatively charged carbon. We're going to draw it attacking the carbonyl. same way that the hydride did. And then we protonate with water. OK. Now, rather than take another whole step and go through, well, here's how Grignard reagents react with um, other types of carbonyls. I'm going to have you do this as both challenge and practice. Well, what is the product and mechanism? Sorry, just going to do the same thing again. Of this reaction.
So this is phenyl magnesium bromide, which is the Grignard made from bromobenzene that we just talked about. And that's going to be an excess. And then water. See if you can draw the mechanism and the product using the same uh, things that we've just been doing. Yeah. Right. Well, as just purely a reduction, right. It doesn't give you what you want. But it's much more powerful, actually, because it adds a carbon-carbon bond. Up to this point, we've only looked at one other reaction that forms carbon-carbon bond. So this expands our ability to make large structures from small ones significantly. OK, let's go through this. Yeah. OK. So we're going to do the same mechanism. The nice thing about mechanistic thinking when you, you know, doing things by solving through the mechanism is it doesn't change. You always do the same mechanism. You just have different molecules to do it on. So what's the first step? What happens first? Yeah, we're going to attract, attack the carbonyl with what? Yeah, on the phenyl. So you can either express this as just pH minus, or you can actually draw the benzene ring there, if that's easier for you. OK, what happens next? Right. Right. So once again, we reform the carbonyl, and the leaving group leaves. Same as before. And now we have a ketone, which again is more reactive than the initial ester. So it'll react again with another equivalent of the nucleophile. Okay, and then we protonate, and we're left with. this tertiary alcohol, which you would name what? 1,1-diphenyl. Close. Oh, it should be butanol, but I drew it wrong. There. <laughs> Okay, yeah. 1,1-diphenyl, one, 1-butanol. One one okay. Questions about that? Okay, rather than moving on to a new topic, Let's look at how this plays into uh, synthesis. So what if I said that I wanted to do, this is an example from the book, if I want to make this How do you make this from a Grignard reaction? In other words, what would you, what would you pick as a starting material? What would you pick as your Grignard reagent? 
and then what would be the product? So try to uh, during your studying. So again, we're going to look at this retrosynthetically, the way that we've done all these synthesis problems, even though this is just one step. One thing you could do, whether you did this one or not, is imagine that you make this bond from the Grignard reaction. Okay? If that's the case, what are my two reagents? Phenyl magnesium bromide is my Grignard, right? And what am I starting with? Yeah, the ketone, 2-butanone. Um, of course, technically, you write the two steps with the water, but we get the idea that that's what you use to make it. All right? So uh, it certainly is a very powerful reaction, um, but don't get carried away. It's mostly just used for addition to carbonyls. We'll do some more problems like this next time and uh, get into some other parts of chapter 13, which we're supposed to be done with this week. So I think, right? Congratulations. I think we're already behind. Maybe not. I'll check the schedule.